the second ohm. The universe was brimming with energy, so intense that it was spontaneously converted into lumps of matter and its arch rival, antimatter. A titanic battle ensued. Subatomic particles annihilated each other, blow for blow, particle for particle. When matter and antimatter meet, they mutually destruct. This is the most powerful release of energy known. If our universe started off with equal amounts of matter and antimatter, all the atoms would annihilate with antiatoms, and we'd end up with a universe consisting just of heat and radiation, but nothing from which we and the stars could have been made. But somewhere in this tiny blazing inferno, the process was slightly imperfect. There was more matter than antimatter. At the end of the battle, matter had won, and the universe was far from empty. Every time a particle of antimatter had been annihilated, the energy was converted into radiation. And that radiation is right before our very eyes. Don't adjust your set. Hidden in the interference on a badly tuned TV set is the energy signal left from the first second of the universe. The discovery of the Big Bang was one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time, even though it was an accident. This is the horn antenna at the Bell Research Labs in New Jersey. Its unusual funnel shape was designed to collect faint radio waves from early communication satellites. It was being used for an entirely different experiment when it detected something truly remarkable. A discovery that would win two American scientists the Nobel Prize. When I visit the horn antenna, I'm always reminded of the, the days back in the 60s when Arno and I were using it seriously. You know, it's amazing to think about, just doing your experiment and discovering the beginning of the universe. But there it is. In 1964, Bob Wilson and his colleague Arno Penzias were using the horn antenna to search for natural radio emissions from our own galaxy. But as soon as they switched their giant earpiece on, it started humming. It was picking up weak but constant background interference. Wilson and Penzias had no idea where the signal was coming from. We looked in various directions. Sometimes we looked at specific objects, other times we looked at random parts of the sky, and every time we did that, we saw the same level, the same amount of excess noise, and it was the same in all directions. They began to realize that it could have a more dramatic origin. What Wilson and Prenzias had stumbled across was a background of microwave radiation, a faint afterglow of the battle that defeated antimatter 12 billion years before. The microwave background comes from the initial very dense and hot state stage of the universe. And as the universe expands, the radiation expands with it. And just like uh, anything else that expands, it tends to cool off. It came from the early stages of the universe, and it's just out there. If you go outside, it'll hit you on the head. You won't notice it because it's so weak. It's at such a low level that it's almost undetectable. Every television set on Earth can detect the radiation from the Big Bang. Antimatter had been defeated, and the universe was still only a second old. Over the next three minutes, the explosions created the kind of matter we would recognize today, hydrogen and helium. It was still too early for the universe to shine. In the dark ages that followed the Big Bang, these elements would combine together and provide the building blocks of the first generation of stars and galaxies.
humans created 12 billion years ago are still with us today. Every time you take a sip of water, you're swallowing hydrogen atoms that were created at the very beginning of the universe. Most of the atoms in our bodies were created in the first moments of the Big Bang. We tend to often dissociate ourselves from the universe. We tend to think of asking questions about it versus us. But of course that's not really true. We're a part of the universe. And when we ask about the origin and evolution of the universe itself, we're really asking questions about the origin and evolution of ourselves. Since the Big Bang, the universe has continued to grow and expand. To understand just how big it has grown, we need to take an imaginary spaceship ride from the Earth to the edge of the visible universe. Our nearest neighbor is the Moon, just a quarter of a million miles away. At the center of our solar system, 93 million miles away, is our Sun. In the center of our solar system, we continue our flight beyond the orbit of the Earth. The next planet out is Mars. Beyond the orbit of Mars is the asteroid belt. A billion miles away is the giant outer planet Saturn almost a thousand times the size of Earth. As we leave the solar system, we would pass one of our earliest interplanetary explorers, Voyager 1, launched in 1977 and traveling at a mere 40,000 miles per hour. Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri, A and B, our nearest stars, are 25 million million miles away. Our solar system sits in the quiet suburbs of a spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, a star city containing over a hundred billion stars. Every star we can see in the night sky lies within our own galaxy. is deep space. Out beyond the Milky Way, 10 million, million, million miles from Earth, is the next spiral galaxy, Andromeda. Even traveling at the speed of light, it would take two million years to reach here. Andromeda and the Milky Way form part of a small cluster of galaxies called the Local Group. But stretching out way beyond the Local Group are much greater clusters of galaxies. If it were possible to travel fast enough for long enough and reach the edge of the known universe, this is what we would see. Uneven clusters of galaxies, a pattern that was predetermined in the very first second of the Big Bang. This is as far as our spaceship can take us. We are now 50 billion trillion miles from Earth. This is where science ends and speculation begins. Astronomers may never see what lies beyond here. This is where the secrets of the universe are hidden.